Hey guys, um, I'm going to touch on this more face subject again because um, it's a lot deeper, I think, than it gets credit for. And uh, basically, the subject of all this is going to be what exactly is, did Jesus empty himself of? And there's other videos that touch on this stuff. Um, they'll probably be better than mine for that matter. But um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, broach the subject a little bit myself. The obvious you know, um, elephant in the room is this word morphe. So if we just read the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I really don't like the way they translated that. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled him, uh, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then it goes on, God exalted him. And uh, what I want to talk about is Morphe. Morphe, um, basically, whatever the Morphe is, is what he would have emptied himself of. And like I said, there's many videos on this that are probably better than mine. But I want to just lay out something that maybe might help some people look at this in a different way. The first thing I want to say, um, as far as this being a hymn, I don't think it is. I'm not going to drag it out. There are several very good papers posted on the internet that the the rhythm of the words and the structure of it is. And these are Trinitarians, by the way. So there really is no reason to believe this is a hymn, in my opinion. And the reason they need it to be a hymn is because hymns were generally sung to God. So that's what that is all about. But the truth of the matter is that the construction of the Greek and the way it's laid out is it's not a hymn. And that's my opinion, be that as it may. So we take a look at the, the thing that's going on. It existed in the form of God. Um, and emptied himself by taking the form of a servant born, being born in the likeness of men. So we go to Morphe, and I think if you read the Strongs, you will get a slightly different take on the word. But the Thayer's is very straightforward. It says, the form by which a person or thing strikes the vision, external appearance. Those are the two definitions the Strongs, is, uh, the Thayer's is going to give. And you're going to find it for the New Testament. You find it in Philippians 2.6, Philippians 2.7, and Mark 16.12. And it all has to do with external appearances. And it's it's not about nature. Okay, You behold this form by the things that they do. It's the actions that you observe or the actual construction of the being that shows you what the form of something is. Now, the big fight for people who maybe don't get into the Morphe thing too much is that the way it was used in Classical Greek versus the way it came to be used in Keon Greek. Now, I've seen all kinds of crazy arguments, and most mostly what people will do that don't want to take the Thayer's definition will stick more with the Classical definition, which would be nature. It would have more to do with nature. But we have proof as far as the Septuagint and Job and the Septuagint and Isaiah that this word had changed. And this happens a lot. A lot of words change throughout cultures. They come to mean different things over time. But if you look at Isaiah, um, I, passage on the top of my head, I'm not even sure. It's the one where it says, and they carve idols in the morphe of man or men. So obviously the word there cannot mean nature. You, you can't look at the idol and say, well, the fact that it looks like a man is telling me something about the nature of the idol itself, that it has a human nature. So it, it was the form. It's, it struck your eye that way. 
So when you looked at Jesus, he struck your eye as God. And that's okay. And then you look at him striking your eye as a servant. The important thing to remember about these cultures is it's always God in what sense. This language was very loose in a lot of terms and it was thrown around. And a lot of people had this applied to them. But he was in the form of God. So we have enough evidence to say, including Ehrman's commentary, which will be done in Roberts, I think, and um, the Septuagint. This word does not have to do with nature. It doesn't have to. And I, quite frankly, I don't think it doesn't, being used in a very late stage of the Keon Greek process versus the stage of the Septuagint. So Jesus struck your eye as God. Now, the important thing here is, what did he empty himself of? That is what is important. The Trinitarian can't really tell you. He can tell you that he gave up his, his uh, divine prerogatives. He, he stepped down to come here. But the funny thing was, he, he didn't, according to the councils, he didn't give up his immortality. Okay? Jesus didn't die. His flesh, flesh nature died. There was not a time that Jesus ceased to exist. He remained omnipresent. He remained um, omnipotent. He just had a human nature. So speaking in his flesh nature, it doesn't matter. None of these qualities can stop because the moment God lacks one of those, con those um, qualities, omnipresence, omniscience, uh, all-knowing, uh, benevolent all, all malevolent all this other stuff if you lose one of these then you're no longer god so you would have this thing where you'd say well jesus was god but he wasn't really god or you have to say like the councils did that he maintained all of those properties he just didn't exhibit them all the time he said things in the flesh which is pretty, you know, probably the stupidest argument that you could really faust on this position because at the end of the day, you're just saying he's lying. Jesus can still tell the truth even as he, if he's in the flesh. So the question is, what did he empty himself of? Okay. And to me, this will explain the passage more for people who kind of struggle with this. So we'll go back to Genesis. <laughs> And we go to Genesis chapter 3. Let's see here. And I think this is really what the key is to most of this. He says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which Lord the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in that day ye eat therefore, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that a tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now, I'm not going to read all of Genesis chapter 3 to you. Um, I might do another video on this, on a word study. But I think at the end of the day, the thing that changed for Adam and Eve is they developed egos. Okay, now everyone has an ego, but this idea of uh, a super ego, they became separated from God. And when you look at the word, when it says the eyes were opened, um, that's word 6491, and you look at the Thayers, it says, um, elsewhere as God has said to open anyone's eyes in a double sense, to restore, restore sight to the blind, to enable to see things which are otherwise hidden from the eyes of mortals. And the words used all over the Bible, but that separation that was put there, they understood things differently. 
they lost that oneness. There was something, there's something that happened. And if you study all the words that are used there about the fruit and the eating and all this, you get a very strange picture of what actually happened to Adam and Eve. They became like God. They became independent in a sense. So, but I'm not going to bore you with that. That's just to let you know that when I look at Genesis chapter 3, I think it does revolve around a type of ego, a change in the way that their mind work, obviously. And then we go to Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus, and this is to me where you see, see the Trinitarian doesn't have passages that he can really go to other than to just basically accuse the text of saying what he wants it to say. But this is where you see Jesus emptying himself. This is where it begins. And I think this had a lot to do with mental things. I'm not sure that he actually per se saw the devil as much as he might have heard the devil. But when we look at it, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So I've never fasted 40 days and 40 nights, but I can tell you he was probably delirious being in the desert. Okay, He was probably in really bad shape because that's a long time to go without food and to be in that kind of heat if you really stop to think about it. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Okay. So, this right here is being in the form of God. This is what this is going to be talking about. And this is him. This is what he actually emptied of himself, among other things. But this is where it begins. You know, and you still have this ludicrous idea of the devil or Satan, whatever you want to call him, coming to the second person of the triune Godhead, which he would have been well aware of, and then having this goofball conversation with him. Now, I guess in Calvinism it could work because the devil, you know, the way everything works with them, but that would be pretty stupid. But if we just read the text for what it says, it says, The tempter came to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that comes, out of, comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and sent him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. That then, then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Okay. That was empty in himself of the authority he had. And the devil sat there. And look at Adam now. And look at Jesus. Look at the difference between the two of them. One went out and basically gained a knowledge, gained an ego of some kind. And the other one came and pushed his own knowledge away pushed his own ego away okay and we get another curious hint to this when we you, you got to look for it but this this all goes around that term of how you're expected to follow jesus when you look at morphe and philippians read you know if you read chapter two he tells you to do these things and so we have to look for examples of that. If he's going to tell you to be like Christ, to have the same mind as Christ, and to be put others before yourself and be a servant, and he's telling you the same thing that Jesus did. So if we take John and throw that out, and you look at all these people, you know, the word became flesh, all this, that's all great, but no one can really prove what that means. You know, it's, it's vague at best. And 
John, there's not going to be too much help here in some senses. But if you turn around and you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see it. You see these examples of him emptying himself of prerogatives. And that would have been ruling class prerogatives. Because of the miracles, because of the authority that he had, he doesn't speak as a scribe. He speaks as someone with authority. And even the demons, they want to flee from him, and he tells them to be silent. Don't go telling people. And so you look at all these things. Even though he was the king, in God's mind, the king from eternity past, coming to our day, okay, the, the revealing of the king, whatever he saw at his baptism, and, you know, Lord only knows, uh, I'm sure... <laughs> Something in him dramatically changed at his baptism, and he, he probably had senses of things. <clears throat> and, you know, I don't know. It, it's, but whatever it was, he, he had a self realization. He knew what he was. That's my take on it. He knew at that point definitely what he was and what he was supposed to be doing. And the closest thing you can get to God would be God in Jesus, the Father in his temple, the temple made without hands. And when you look at it, and you understand that is the closest thing you're going to get to God. Is it really that hard to understand when Paul makes these statements about being in the form of God? Having this authority and this power like I said, it's how he struck your eye. It's not the nature of who Jesus was on the inside. It's when you saw Jesus, how did he strike your eye? Well, he was righteous. He displayed powers that he says were not his. He spoke teachings that confounded the wise that were considered to be better than everyone else's teaching, who he said were not his. He raised the dead, performed all. So, see, as you're observing him, you're seeing a form of God. These are the things God can do. That's how I know. But then he throws it on the other side and he says, well, but he took the form of a servant. It doesn't say he became a human being. It said he was found as a human being. He was in the schema of a man. The temptation. He knew his place. As a man, he knew he was not God. So he did not reach for these things to be God. He emptied himself of what? His ego. Of, of himself. And that's what we're told to do. Empty of ourselves. So when we go to Matthew chapter 10 now, there's another little funny thing that comes out here. Um, I lost my place here. Let me see. Um, there we go. Almost there. Okay, so if we go to John chapter 10, I mean, excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, let me go up a little bit. I'll just start here. Um, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore ye are more valuable than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. Now think about that sword. What is that sword? For uh, and it has to do with separation. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be thy of his own household. He that loveth the father or mother, he that loveth father or mother more than me, is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy than me, worthy of me. And he shall taketh not his taketh not his cross and followeth after me, is not worthy of me. He 
that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Now, I'm going to open up the ESV here. This is something that's actually very, very interesting, this little passage. Because people don't think about what he's saying at all. Now, when you look at everything that he said up until this point, like I said, read all of chapter 10, you're going to find out it's about doing things. It's about something internally that's going on that always has an external effect on the outside. You can't pick up your cross and follow him if it doesn't happen in here first, right? You, you got to be willing to do it. You can't love him more than you love your father and mother. You can't you can't do any of these things unless something happens in here. And then he goes on. Um, I'm sorry. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of the little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he by no means will lose his reward. So it's all these external things that have an internal cause. So, you know, you're not going to receive a prophet. Unless internally, you say, well, yeah, I should, but I want to focus on, on this, on verse 39. When you look at the words here, and, uh, because I think there's something very interesting that kind of reveals itself. Now, if you just go off the King James Version again for the parsing, when you look at shall lose, it's um, a polemy, and it's a future active indicative. And the reason I bring that up, why it's important, you could put to perish or to be lost or ruined or destroyed, but the root of its meaning is to destroy, to put out of the way entirely, abolish or put to an end to ruin so when you look at it, it it's basically it it means to destroy utterly and in the middle voice it means to perish um, and then if we go down in the strongs and if you look at it in the active voice they put loss loss lose loss lost and it signifies to destroy, utterly kill, or to lose utterly in the sense of losing, you know, violently. So let's think about this for just one second. Let's just use the word to destroy, you know, just as something to fill in the blank. And when you get to the word life, so he that findeth his life shall lose it. Well, it's pretty obvious Jesus can't be talking about you just being alive, can he? You were born. Of course, you were alive. But when you look at the word for life, it's that K word, psychia, psychia. It's where we get the word psychology from. And it gives these definitions, breath, breath of life, vital force that animates the body of animals and men. So you think Jesus is saying that? Those who find their breath will lose it. Does that make a lot of sense? Or does it make more sense if he's pertaining to the soul and what it actually means? If he's saying, insofar as constituted by the rights, use of aids offered by God, it can attain the highest and excuse the blessedness, blah, 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 blah. Um, and the seat of the feelings, desires, affections, aversions. Of our heart or soul in definition B even though it's talking about the soul stuff at the end it says regarded as a moral being designed for everlasting life moral being so think about it he, he's not gonna tell you whoever finds their actual you're alive you found out you were alive 
No. <laughs> the seat of your feelings, desires, affections. Okay, so let's let's go back and look now. And when you look at the finding part, it too is an active participle. But it says to come upon, hit upon, to meet with after searching, to find a thing sought. And if you go down, um, to find out for oneself, to acquire, to get obtained, to procure, to find by inquiry, thought, examination, scrutiny, observation, to find out by practice and experience. So, makes a little bit more sense to me because of the active apolemy word. It's basically who who seeks out his desires and heart shall lose them and see when it says he that loses his life for me it's the same words it's a polemy in the active participle so he that destroys his desires for my sake shall find what i'm telling you this this all revolves around that concept when he talks about you know not my will but yours and these these it's a giant battle between the states of mind within a person and like i said if you look at matthew chapter 10 he's not good jesus is not going to tell you those who find out you're breathing hey you found that you're breathing now you're going to lose it now you're going to lose you found your breath now you're going to lose it this connotation to these words finding out one's desires and then destroying them for my sake. What did Jesus do? He destroyed his or lost his own desires for God's sake. And you see how the chain goes. But I think if you look at Genesis chapter 3, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 10, it explains a lot about what is going on in Philippians, what Paul has to be talking about. Because quite frankly, they don't really tell you where else he emptied himself. And that's why Trinitarians are in such disagreement about this passage. They fight with each other about this because you can say whatever you want as long as you keep it outside of the Bible text. It doesn't say anywhere he emptied himself of divine pride. It doesn't, there's nothing even remotely like that. But when we look at the actual explanations for things, we look at how the split with Adam and Eve came and what they developed. We look at, in Matthew chapter 4, the temptation. What did he actually deny? He really wasn't denying the devil, was he? He was denying himself. He was getting rid of his ego, his desires. And he tells us the same thing. If you read all of chapter 10, it's, it's a, about internal things. And that's what I'm telling you. That's what he's saying in that sense of life. When you receive, when uh, you find your life, you shall lose it. I'm telling you, it's, it's where you're putting your heart. It's where you're putting your treasures. And that's why he talks about he that receiveth me and the ones who receive them right after that. Right after that. To take up the cross by its very nature. They say, yeah, it's to die. That is true. But what context is Jesus using it in? See, why would he tell you these other things? Oh, just pick up your cross, which means you're going on a death march. So why are you telling me to receive prophets? Why are you telling me to give children drinks of water? Because I'm going to die. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that by picking up your cross... You're denying yourself. You are dying. And if you find your life, you're going to lose it. If you find your desires, if you seek out your desires, you're going to lose your, your desires. In other words, your life. The sword that separates. The whole passage, this whole thing is about division between what you want and between what you should want. You should want to be close to God and do his will. But what you want is different than that. 
Paul is notorious for talking about Jesus as the second Adam. He talks about the risen Christ, which is a new type of humanity, not a new type of God. It's a new type of humanity. He compares that to Adam, <coughs> who was the first type of humanity, who thought being equal with God was not a big deal. Think about it. They gain, what did he know before? He gained knowledge of good and evil. So what did he know before? Before he gained knowledge of good and evil. He had no concept of it. He was in perfect unity with God. He was in perfect unity with God. And then he broke that unity by developing desires of his own. And it, I'm telling you, there's this ego thing runs through the entire Bible. It's the reason we have trouble with God. It's the reason this Trinity thing is such a powerful idea. Because it plays with that idea. The ego. And then you look at these different belief systems. You know, they, they, they don't even encourage you to get rid of your ego. You're once saved, you're always saved. Um... You can't do anything of yourself. It's all God. So just be you. Just do what you do. And it, you die to yourself daily. Seek out your own desires and you're going to lose. It's plain to see. So I hope that clears up some of this more faith thing anyway. It, it's, and like I said, it's not a hymn. There's some very good papers written on this, and it, it's all wrong to be a him. They needed it to be a him, so that's what they turned it into. So be that as it may, guys, um, I hope that was somewhat helpful. Uh, God bless.